Thanks for uh, joining us for this uh, talk on medical care. I uh, have the task of being between you and lunch, and uh, that's always a challenge, but this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. It's such a favorite that I've actually um, got 85 slides here, so um, I figure I have about, what, 30 seconds per slide, so we'll move through this as quickly as I can. There are a lot of topics that we could discuss here, but what I wanted to focus on are some of the reasons that we see higher costs in medical care in the United States and, and other countries too, but especially in the United States where the cost has become uh, higher and higher, it seems, every year, and uh, where there seems to be a pretty big gap between the United States and other countries. Uh, also, we'd like to, um, I'd like to go over with you some of the um, uh, current uh, legislation, the Affordable Care Act, which has been a very controversial part of the uh, efforts to deal with medical costs in the United States, and then the proposals for something called Medicare for All, which you have probably heard about. Uh, so without further ado, let me just um, outline where we're going here in the next few minutes. Uh, first, we'll look at the rising medical care costs in the United States, and then in particular drug costs. We've seen uh, some drugs that have become extraordinarily expensive. I'd like to offer some suggestions as to why that might be happening. Uh, there's been some uh, proposals for price controls on drugs. Uh, I don't think that's the way to go, but I, I think there are some interventions from the government that have contributed to that problem. I'd like to talk a little bit about medical finance in the U.S., and there's where we'll discuss the Affordable Care Act and, uh, and the Medicare for All. And then last, I'd like to do a brief comparison uh, of the United States versus some other countries and their medical care systems, uh, some of the problems that they've had. Uh, we've um, actually seen a kind of a convergence um, between the U.S. And, and, and European nations on how we deal with medical care. Uh, it seems that many of those countries are moving gradually toward a, a more private sector-oriented system, and the U.S. has been moving apparently in the opposite direction, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So first, rising medical care costs. Vijay Boyapati in a Mises.org um, article uh, pointed out four reasons for rising medical care costs in the United States. Uh, one is the employer-provided health insurance that began in the 1940s. A lot of this has to do with high marginal tax rates that we saw late in World War II. Uh, with very high marginal tax rates on income, employers were looking for ways to offer compensation to their employees that would not be heavily taxed. And so when the Supreme Court decided that the uh, provision of, of health insurance to employees would not be a taxable benefit, then this gave employ employers a way to offer employees a benefit without uh, the heavy taxation that we were seeing at that time. Second, he mentions medical licensure. Medical licensure is a way of restricting entry into the medical profession, and that can lead to less competition and higher prices. Third, he uh, mentions the obesity ep epidemic. I won't spend any time on that here, but uh, that may, may be a contributor to numerous kinds of health problems. And then fourth, intellectual property, uh, patents, for example, on drugs that may have uh, led to higher prices. The economic concept of moral hazard it sounds like moral hazard to be what you experience if you went to Las Vegas or something, but in economic terms, moral hazard is the risk or hazard that an insured party might participate in activities that are undesirable from the insurer's point of view because they make it more likely that claims will be larger. So in terms of, say, automobile insurance, if I have car insurance and I'm covered for damage to my car, I might be more likely to park my car on the street where it's more likely to be sideswiped by passing vehicle, or I might be less likely to uh, pull the car into the garage if there's a storm coming that might drop hail on my car. Uh, that's, uh, uh, there, there's a similar kind of problem in medical care. If I believe that my medical expenses will be covered by a third party, then I'm much less likely to refuse those medical treatments, even if the marginal benefit of those treatments is very, very small. 
So uh, this diagram would show what we would see if we had a, a completely nationalized healthcare system. The moral hazard would suggest that individuals would not be very careful shoppers. They would not be paying the uh, price of the medical care. That would be covered by taxpayers in general, so the individual is facing a pretty much zero marginal cost. Now, there may be wait time, which is important, and people may want to avoid waiting in line, but the monetary cost, at least, of their medical care would be so low that the quantity of medical care they demand may be enormous. If someone's going to uh, cover, for example, I, you notice I'm wearing eyeglasses, uh, I uh, have some incentive to avoid uh, very high cost methods of, of correcting my vision. I have not had laser eye surgery, but if my insurer said to me, well, we'll cover the full cost, or if the government said we'll cover the cost of laser eye surgery, well then at that point, I, you know, $300 for glasses or $3,000 for uh, laser eye surgery doesn't matter to me because I'm not paying the bill. So my, my consumption of those services would rise substantially. And uh, even, even a small um, nod to these price incentives can make a big difference. So if you, if you have people that have a, at least a little copay uh, on their medical services, this can actually deter people from engaging in, in unnecessary medical expenses. This is a, a, a chart that I've shown in the, in the past just because it's such a, a beautiful illustration of what's happened to costs in, in the medical care um, field as as we've seen price inflation in other areas, we see massive price inflation in medical care. So here's, here's medical care, 118% increase in uh, prices over a 20-year period. And then if you look at uh, general uh, inflation, uh, only about 64% over that same 20-year period. So what's going on here? Well, one clue is if you look at cosmetic services, which are much less likely to be covered by third parties, such as insurance companies or government, the uh, increase in cost there has been only about 30%, lower than the general uh, rate of price inflation in the economy. So perhaps uh, the fact that most Americans are receiving um, care that is provided by a third party may have something to do with the fact that people just aren't responding to uh, higher prices by reducing the quantity they, they would like to um, consume. Uh, one study indicated that uh, the moral hazard is, and this is a, 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 um, uh, a recent study, even though it's, it's responding to um, literature from the 1980s, that medical care cost growth actually does have a strong relationship to the moral hazard problem. There's been some debate over this, which I won't go into, but um, as uh, Foy, Shiamana, Kozak, and Filipponi pointed out, uh, insurance drives the marginal price of medical care at the point of use to near zero. So consumers or physicians acting as their agents demand care until the marginal product of additional care is nearly zero. So um, we see the same thing in other kinds of markets. Uh, to, uh, tomorrow I've got a talk on higher education. We've seen a very similar kind of, of phenomenon going on there uh, where third parties are paying for higher education with greater and greater frequency. And uh, uh, that means that students are not responding as much to price signals as we might have seen in other markets. So. Um, Empirical evidence exists in support of the conventional view, that is the moral hazard uh, view. Studies have found that a fully insured population spends about 40 to 50 percent more than a population with a large deductible, and their status is not measurably improved by the additional services. Now, this is called flat of the curve medicine, where spending on medical care increases even though additional gains from such spending are very low or non-existent. So part of the argument um, for having third parties, insurance, or government pay for medical care is that, well, all medical care is going to make people better off. And that, that's sort of the assumption that, that this is going to improve your life. So uh, why should we put any limit on, on the amount of medical care people consume? But in fact, we see that that's not the case. One famous, or depending on your perspective, infamous experiment that was conducted a few years ago 
in Oregon expanded Medicaid coverage randomly to additional um, uh, applicants in the state of Oregon. And what they found was that the improvements in health outcomes for those who were, their names were drawn, they were part of this lottery, they, they, they found themselves having one additional Medicaid coverage, and they found that th their health outcomes didn't improve. They, they, they had additional medical services, in fact, uh, they, as, as um, this study indicated, they used prescription drugs, office visits, preventive care services, mammograms. Uh, they had annual spending per individual in excess of $1,100, and yet they weren't measurably better off in terms of their health. So we can throw money at, the, at, at individuals to, to cover various medical care, but it's not necessarily going to make people better off. We have seen rapid technological change in medical care. A family member of mine recently had surgery, which uh, just a few years ago would have entailed a long recovery period, probably more pain and more risk of complications and infection. And yet uh, she was uh, out of the hospital um, very quickly and, and has had um, a very good recovery. Uh, this, this kind of technique has been um, uh, much more common as, as we develop new ways of doing surgeries and new ways of treating illnesses and, and, uh, and injuries. So uh, we have all this medical technology, and yet we're using this in ways that increase costs and uh, in some cases are not really improving the outcomes. The same study I've been Referring to here says that medical insurance in its current state discourages individuals from economizing on healthcare decisions and incentivizes the adoption and overconsumption of services with progressively diminishing returns on investment. And they refer to this as the medical cost ratchet. So we're seeing uh, people spending money on these services that the, probably there was a cheaper alternative that would have been 95% as good, but that was not even considered because if somebody else is paying the bill, why, why bother? Uh, some years ago, I had some back trouble and I went to a uh, chiropractor and the chiropractor said, well, I'd, I'd like for you to have an MRI. I said, well, okay, and I uh, scheduled an MRI and I think I had it within a couple of days. Try that in some countries. Um, and uh, I didn't even ask about the cost. I had health insurance that would cover the MRI uh, didn't ask the chiropractor if maybe an x-ray would have provided, you know, 95% of the benefit of an MRI without as much cost. An x-ray would have been dirt cheap compared to the MRI. But I'm not a very good shopper because I'm not paying the bill. So uh, I went to have the MRI, and I got the bill later in the mail, and I saw where my insurance had indeed picked up um, almost all of the cost. And the sticker price on this MRI was something like five or $6,000. And an X-ray would have been, I don't know, what, 50 or $60, I don't know. But it, it, it was the added advantage of having this super sophisticated MRI diagnostic test done worth the additional $5,000 that, that it entailed? Maybe not. Um, so one way that we've seen um, uh, policy kind of adjust to help people become better shoppers is the advent of healthcare savings accounts, or HSAs. And these are um, accounts which are tax favored. That is, you can put money into these and you don't have to pay taxes on any contributions to these accounts. And they're paired with a high deductible health insurance account uh, for high uh, cost events. So if you get into a, an accident and it's a $10,000 medical bill or $50,000 medical bill, that is picked up by that high deductible medical insurance while um, routine kinds of expenses and deductible size expenses would be picked up by this HSA that you've contributed to tax-free. So uh, that's, that's one way that we, we've, seen people, uh, uh, we've seen people become better shoppers when they're confronted with that kind of policy. And uh, that, that does seem to be a, a step in the right direction, but uh, not, uh, not as common as I, as I think uh, I'd like it to be. So technology drives up costs, but 
not always in proportion to the level of improvement in care that that technology aims to deliver. Let's talk a little bit about drug costs, a matter of great concern. People have seen these kinds of stories coming out for some years about how some uh, pharmaceutical company uh, buys up a patent on a, on a drug. They're essentially a monopoly provider of that drug, and the price shoots up. Uh, the EpiPen was one of these cases where uh, Mylan, the, the uh, patent holder on the EpiPen, uh, has exploited the fact that they've got this government-protected market share. The uh, uh, EpiPen is um, vital for some kinds of, of uh, for people who have allergic reactions to some things. And so schools, for example, or public schools anyway, are required to keep these EpiPens on hand. So they've got a, a locked-in market, and uh, there's, with, with protection from the government, against competition, there's no particular reason we would expect these firms like Milan to refrain from increasing the price. So uh, in addition to the patent issue, we've also got the FDA standing in the way of, a, um, of, of innovation and, and competition. So if you want to get a drug that is similar to an EpiPen out into the market, you've got to uh, uh, pass the FDA's uh, stringent requirements, which are very expensive, and uh, it's not altogether clear that they are creating advantages for in, in drug safety that are correspondent to the, uh, to the added cost. So um, as uh, this article points out, um, Michael Fleck says, uh, thus far the competing companies to Milan have been given excuse after excuse as to why their products can't see equal footing in the market. It's essentially a rigged game. Uh, another pharmaceutical company named Gilead bought the patent for a hepatitis C cure uh, called Suvaldi for $11 billion, took the drug through the last stages of the FDA approval process, which was completed in 2013, and then the very next year they made $12.4 billion from that drug. One course of treatment in the U.S. costs $84,000 for this drug. Very effective. But if you want to compete with Gilead, uh, you'll be facing all kinds of hurdles imposed by the government, FDA hurdles, perhaps uh, patent hurdles, and, and so forth. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, uh, of course, took the position that uh, the, uh, the, the company is morally culpable here and not, not the government that's creating these barriers to entry. So he said, Gilead should be held responsible morally and legally for all the HCV-related illnesses and deaths that occur as the result of their unacceptable pricing policies. Despite record-breaking profits, Gilead continues to keep the price of Savosbavir so far above its modest production costs that millions of HCV-infected individuals are unable to access the treatment they require. So what would he like to see happen? Perhaps price controls? Uh, it's it's um, clear that he wants the government to in intervene uh, more in this market, but I would argue that's government intervention in the first place that's created the problem that we're observing. Now, what about patents? I mean, the argument's been made and been made uh, frequently that without the patent to protect a new drug innovation that we would see very few new drugs brought into the market because the innovator would not have that temporary monopoly to allow them to, um, uh, to, to gain something from the expense they put into or the research and development of this drug. So a, a British medical journal survey of the most noteworthy medical and pharmaceutical discoveries of history, which you can see here, uh, lists a lot of uh, uh, very significant life-saving advances in medical technology, but only two of these, birth control pills and Thorazine, were patent protected. The rest of these came onto our market, saved countless lives without benefit of patent protection. Uh, so it's, it's not at all clear that, that intellectual property is as essential as we've made it out to be. Uh, maybe not we in this room, but uh, we, uh, Americans often think that without patent protection that 
we would have less drug innovation. That's, that's not necessarily the case. One CDC survey indicated that, uh, that of the 10 most important medical discoveries of the 20th century, none of them had anything to do with patents. Nathan Nicolaison in uh, Amisa's Daily article a few years ago said that expanding the scope of research beyond pharmaceutical drugs, a survey of R&D labs and company managers revealed that between 23 and 35 percent believe a patent is an effective way of getting a return on investment. At the same time, 51 percent believe trade secrets to be an effective way of ensuring returns. Maybe patents aren't, again, as essential as we expect them to be. The FDA has... I, I, uh, taught in my classes about the FDA. I had to teach a course at Wofford College on uh, regulation, and I uh, go through the medical regulation as well as other, other areas of regulation. And there's a, a very common perception among students coming into the class that if we did not have an agency like the FDA, that you'd have uh, pharmaceutical companies selling poison to people or selling placebos to people that don't really have, the, uh, have, a, have an effect, a, a positive effect anyway, and that if we did not have the FDA, consumers would be helpless. They would just be the, the victims, uh, routinely the victims of pharmaceutical companies that are, that are in, engaging in some kind of fraud uh, or negligence. And I say, well, uh, now, so are you telling me that without the FDA, pharmaceutical companies wouldn't do any testing of their drugs? They wouldn't, they wouldn't care if they had uh, sold something to the public that created harm instead of good? Um, say, well, what happened to, what happened to what's the latest? Uh, Chipotle, I guess, when uh, Chipotle had a couple of food poisoning cases among two or three of their numerous uh, franchisees. What happened to their stock price? Was this good for Chipotle that they were selling people food that evidently made them sick. I mean, Chipotle's stock dropped. They're, they had, uh, uh, this was headline news that was not good for their business. Why would we expect it to be different for, I mean, I'm not going into the back of every restaurant that I go into and inspecting the food preparation process to see to it that they're preparing this in a sanitary fashion and so forth. And it's not because they've got some kind of plaque on the wall with a big blue letter A on there that I trust them. I mean, the, the, the inspection processes that I'm counting on are the ones that are carried out every day by, <clears throat> by the other consumers, the other customers. And if they have a bad reputation, I'm not going to patronize their restaurant. They know this. They have a very strong incentive to make sure that they're their product is of high quality, and the pharmaceutical companies, at least those that might face some competition in a free market, uh, would also have the same kind of, kind of uh, incentive. I'm going to skip over some of this in the interest of time, but I, I will point out that the FDA does more than just impose hundreds of millions of dollars of costs on pharmaceutical companies. They also impose delays. And we've seen some legislation in the last couple of years under the Trump administration to try to allow people more access to drugs that are in a, an experimental phase that have not completely passed the FDA, this right to try uh, law that we've seen. Uh, and I think, again, that's a step in the right direction. But uh, there's, if there's a delay, and there always will be a delay, even in a, in a completely free market, you see pharmaceutical companies that would test, and that would take some time. They would test and make sure that the drug is okay before they would sell it to the public because they don't want to be sued. They don't want to see a uh, decline in their reputation. But the FDA may extend that testing period out because the costs of doing so for the FDA are not as great. So for a pharmaceutical company, they've got to think about the people that want to buy the drug and they want to buy it now if it's helpful because that will save their lives and they may be very desperate to, to have this drug on the market. The FDA doesn't have the same incentives and so they may have a longer period of delay before they allow the drug onto the market. And so we've seen that uh, some of these delays have pr resulted in significant loss of human life. So Septra, which is an antibiotic, was delayed by about five years by the FDA. One estimate is that this cost 80,000 lives in the United States. Uh, beta blockers, the lag in FDA approval, may have cost a quarter million lives in the United States. 
And yet the FDA is regarded as being one of these essentials in the panoply of, of federal regulation that we just, well, you can't imagine life without the FDA. Uh, what would we do? We'd all be just uh, uh, dying uh, uh, horrible deaths as a result of, and, and there are a few cases you, you can, of course, if you bring up the FDA's uh, lags and so forth, you'll also read about thalidomide, which is a drug that the FDA was, uh, they had kept off the market while European countries had allowed that drug onto the market. It was a drug for um, morning sickness in pregnant women, and it turned out to create very terrible birth defects. Uh, so the FDA says, well, you know, if it weren't for us, you'd have, you'd have thalidomide on the market. And yet, uh, the costs of the FDA delays, the uh, pharmaceutical companies that never bring a helpful drug onto the market because they can't afford the cost, those are not factored into most of those discussions. According to Mary Ruart, uh, at least half of pharmaceutical innovations get shelved because the cost to take a drug through the regulatory testing process makes those drugs uneconomic for drug developers to pursue. She found that even with very conservative, conservative assumptions, the years of life lost due to FDA clinical demands is in the millions. I'm a, again, in the interest of time, I'll skip over some of this. If you're interested in more on, on this, I'll be happy to share the rest of the presentation, the file, with you. But let me move along to medical finance. All right, so you've heard in the political debates recently some discussion of Medicare for All and, uh, of course, the Affordable Care Act, which was passed under the Obama administration, is, has been very controversial. This is how Americans tend to cover their health uh, costs. The, this is health insurance enrollment as of this year in the United States. We have, as you can see here, the the plurality of these, uh, of, of these plans are employment-based coverage, 151 million people covered by employment-based insurance, health insurance. Uh, the orangey, yellow, brown uh, down here, uh, that approximately third of the pie are single-payer plans, Medicare, Medicaid, and related kinds of coverage, but mainly Medicare, Medicaid. So these are single-payer, government-run plans. Now we have about 20, 25 million legal residents who are uninsured, and then we have some who are in the individual market, 14 million people who went out on their own to buy health insurance, and then something called Medicare Advantage, which is a government program, but it's privately administered and is uh, something we'll discuss in a few minutes. <coughs> Subsidies that we have in the, in the United States for both uh, privately enrolled insurance plans and for, of course, Medicare and Medicaid and Medicare Advantage, which is, again, something we'll discuss in a minute, the subsidies to these are quite high. In uh, in the case of Switzerland, Switzerland's been able to offer something that is much more like a private market. It's not free market, don't hear me as saying that, but it has less public, less government uh, subsidization of their system, and yet they have something very close to universal coverage of, uh, by insurance in, in Switzerland. Maybe we'll come back to this in a, in a minute, but... The uh, ACA, or Affordable Care Act, or Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is what we, we call it. Sometimes we call that Obamacare, colloquially. Uh, but the main components of this, of this legislation were to um, require insurers to cover all applicants without regard to medical history. Premiums would be set mainly on geographic location, called a community rating, and age, not on gender, not on any pre-existing conditions. We'll come back to the pre-existing condition thing in a minute. Everyone was required to obtain health insurance except those deemed unable to afford it and those religious groups that have obtained waivers. Now, this was, uh, the, the teeth were taken out of this recently. The, 
there are no penalties now for not getting uh, health insurance. The, the mandatory coverage isn't quite so mandatory uh, anymore. But employers with 50 or more employees were required to provide coverage for employees working more than 30 hours a week. And health insurance policies had to cover certain services and not have any cap on annual or lifetime benefits for an individual. The reason for requiring everyone to have some kind of coverage is to avoid uh, adverse selection, which is where the people with the worst health are the first ones to line up for health insurance and therefore the most costly for the health insurance companies. And so this, if you required everyone healthy or unhealthy to get insurance, that means in effect you can require the healthy individuals to subsidize the unhealthy individuals. That was the, the, the idea here. So those who are very expensive to cover will be covered as well as those who are uh, cheap to cover. So subsidies were built in because, of course, this still means that you've got insurance companies covering individuals who have uh, very high uh, routine medical expenses. And uh, so the, the, the subsidization here was um, uh, part of the plan from the beginning. This is exacerbating a long-term problem with American medical care, which is that we have not just a patient paying a doctor or other medical provider and receiving a service, but we've got an insurance company and we've got the government all involved in the mix. And the patient's standards get lost sometimes because of the... Uh, because of the rules, the, 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 the procedures of the insurance companies. The insurance companies themselves want doctors to reduce the, the cost of care, and so they'll put requirements on doctors, and the patients themselves may not have a whole lot of control over the health insurance company because in order to change health insurance companies, they might have to change their employer, and that's a difficult thing for most people to do. So... The bulk of the cost currently is being paid by someone other than the patient, which leads to this moral hazard problem I mentioned earlier. Government pays around half, insurance companies pay a little less than half, and the patient pays only a small fraction of the total cost of coverage. If you're the medical provider now, who are you going to listen to? <coughs> Whoever's writing your check, right? So the patient may want one thing, but the insurance company says, no, you, you don't really need that. Or, the, or Medicaid says, you don't really need that. And so you're stuck with uh, much louder voices from the third party payer, and the patient's own priorities may be lost in this mix. And so the Affordable Care Act complicated this significantly, and this is actually a far less complicated diagram than one I presented here in previous years, but basically this adds to the regulation on, on insurance companies, it adds to the regulation on uh, employers, it re again required patients to have insurance, uh, the care providers themselves are faced with numerous new restrictions, so this introduced a, uh, a, a, a much more um, tangled web of regulation that patients and employers now have to navigate. That's actually one of the more serious problems with American medical care is the complexity is such that even the experts don't really understand it. And for someone trying to navigate this process, let's say you've got an elderly relative that needs to have uh, uh, care and, and can't make decisions for herself, trying to get through that process without uh, bankrupting yourself can be, can be very, very difficult. So the unintended consequences of the ACA were that premiums went up. Many people were choosing to simply pay the penalty rather than sign up for very expensive insurance plans. Insur insurers were pulling out of the government-established health care exchanges, so options were limited, and employers began limiting the number of workers who were working over 30 hours a week so that they, you had a lot of 49ers. You had a lot of employers that had 49 employees, but not 50 because that subjects them to additional regulation under the ACA. So the ACA effectively subsidizes coverage for uninsured Americans who are sick by overcharging 
uninsured Americans who are healthy. Uh, so those high premiums are not accompanied by low deductibles. Indeed, the median deductible for a silver plan in 2019 was about $4,400. In 2010, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that that 24 million Americans would enroll in the exchanges by this year. The actual figure was only about 9 million. People were not signing on to this in the numbers that were expected. <clears throat> on average, premiums in the individual market have doubled since the ACA went into effect. Uh, the... Um, uh, this, this is actually a New York Times article that cited a paper that a student of mine and I wrote for the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons a few years ago. Uh, the, the insurance premiums were supposed to fall. Uh, Obama had promised during his campaign that the average family would see health insurance premiums drop by $2,500 a year. Instead, they rose by around $3,700 a year. Um, as of uh, 2014. Insurers have dropped out of the market, as I pointed out here, and this map is a county-by-county county map, and you can see the, the yellow counties on this map are the ones where there's only one carrier, insurance carrier, in the exchange. The uh, uh, number of counties with uh, only two carriers, even uh, just not very much competition, it's about 1,200 counties, or about 38% of the counties. So we have a majority of the counties in the U.S. who have only one or two insurance carriers in the exchange. Now, that may not be a majority of the population, but it's a majority of the counties in the U.S. Now, the predictions that uh, if, you, if you undermine the ACA, people are going to be dying in the streets. I mean, we, you saw these kinds of predictions uh, that we're going to make America sick again and, and people are going to be uh, dying by the tens of thousands. Um, but we actually, as Bob Murphy's pointed out in a Mises Wire article a couple of years ago, we don't have to make this choice between protecting uh, property rights and, and preventing people from suffering and dying. We actually see a compatibility between these objectives. So Murphy, uh, sorry, this is not Bob, this is uh, Oren Cass, uh, pointed out that the best statistical estimate for the number of lives saved each year by the ACA is zero. Now, this is an updated chart from uh, Bob Murphy's article. I put some more recent data in here. The most recent I could find on this was 2017, but you can see this is the age-adjusted mortality rate in the United States per 100,000. And uh, 2014 is the year that the insurance coverage under the ACA fully expanded. And after that, we do not see very encouraging changes in mortality rates. In fact, they've gone up a bit. Uh, mortality rates have, have, have slightly increased. And you can see that in the years past, there was a pretty encouraging downward trend in those mortality rates. Now, this is a very... Uh, aggregative kind of statistic to show you, but um, the, uh, the, the problem, I think, is, is evident. Now, what about pre-existing conditions? How much would you have to be paid to insure that house from loss by fire? We'll see. How much does the house cost? That's the premium, right? Now, this is why coverage of pre-existing conditions, if insurance companies are going to do this, then uh, the, the ACA assumed that what we're going to have to do is require the insurance companies to, to cover these pre-existing conditions. Otherwise, there's no way to, to handle this. But in fact, there are ways to handle this. You can insure in your, your insurability. Um, so uh, David Henderson pointed out that under the individual insurance that existed before Obamacare, beneficiaries could buy guaranteed renewable health insurance. So if they developed a condition while insured, they could still buy health insurance at a premium that applied to the whole pool they were in when they originally bought insurance. We do this with life insurance all the time. So guaranteed renewability. Uh, parents, conceivably, could even buy insurability insurance for their children, even children they don't have yet. There's no reason why we couldn't have a contract written that says, if I have children and they end up with a problem, perhaps from birth, a medical problem, then uh, you guarantee that you'll, you'll cover them for health uh, medical expenses 
at a pre-set uh, um, premium. No particular reason that could not happen. And then, of course, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of charity. This is often kind of blown off as, as unhelpful, but it's, it's significant. It has been and, and I think could be again. All right, before I run out of time, let me say a few words about Medicare for All. Um, so the, the idea here is we would have first dollar coverage, no copays, no deductibles. Everything would be covered, uh, dental, vision, hearing, as well as the usual uh, doctor uh, visits and, 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 and hospital expenses. Uh, payments to providers would be cut by at least 40% relative to private insurance payments. Uh, so there would be, th this, is, this is part of where they think they're going to get the money from, is by requiring that doctors and nurses and hospitals accept lower payments. Now, hospitals today and, and other medical providers count on the relatively higher reimbursements from private insurance to offset the uh, sometimes the, the losses that they take when receiving compensation for Medicare and Medicaid. So this is a, this is a uh, uh, if you take away that, uh, that kind of transfer from reimbursements from privately covered patients to uh, those covered by government, then you, you may have medical providers that simply close up shop. You may have doctors that decide that it's just not worth it anymore and they're going to quit. We've already had a problem in some fields in, in that. Uh, Mercatus, uh, Mercatus study indicated that Medicare for All would add approximately $33 trillion to federal budget commitments for the first 10 years, that increases in federal medical expenses would be about 10.7% of GDP in 22, uh, 2022, 12.7% uh, by 2031, and then rising thereafter. We would see, in fact, such a huge increase in costs that a doubling of all currently projected federal and corporate income tax collections would be insufficient to finance the federal costs of the plan, added federal costs of the plan. Uh, so um, let me just say something about um, Medicare Advantage. There are four parts to Medicare. For those of you that are not from the U.S. or not familiar with the way Medicare works, there's A and B, which are the hospital and physician coverage portions. That dates back to the very beginning of Medicare. Then we have Part C, which is this um, uh, kind of an HMO type of, uh, medical plan where there's a, a monthly fee that you pay rather than fee for service. This dates back to about 1997. Uh, it has an out-of-pocket annual spend limit. Many of these plans, which are privately run, privately administered under Medicare rules, have uh, drug coverage as well, and there is competition among the different plans. There's 21 different plans. I'm not trying to project uh, this, this image of this as a libertarian solution to, to medical uh, insurance, but what I find interesting is that this is a lower cost method of providing medical care for many Americans. And in fact, the number of Americans who are signing on to this has increased. People evidently, out of all the different Medicare options, the uh, one, or the, well, out of all, out of the, the Medicare options available, there aren't that many, but a, out of the Medicare options that are available, people are increasingly preferring this plan, which allows more flexibility in which doctors they, uh, they can choose. Um, the orange here is the Medicare Advantage or Part C enrollment, uh, which has increased significantly in the last decade. And uh, single-payer Medicare, the traditional Medicare, has been flat and even declining here in the last couple of years. So when someone says, well, we need Medicare for all, they're really talking about single-payer Medicare, which is more like old Medicare Part A and B, not like this um, relatively market-oriented, competition-oriented uh, kind of, of, of system. So under Medicare for All, um, insurance companies are not going to go away. 
They're still going to be around. If, it's, if you think Medicare for All is going to get rid of these nasty insurance companies that don't do what you want them to do, they're still going to be there. They're still going to be managing the system as they do with Medicaid managed care contractors today. Uh, doctors may exit. Uh, private insurance could be outlawed if it duplicates benefits provided by the government. And in fact, we see in Europe a uh, private, a, a shift toward private insurance as supplements to or replacements for the government provided services of, uh, or, or care that's not uh, what people really want. We see some major financial problems with Medicare and uh, what we're interested in on this chart is the HI or health insurance, uh, sorry, hospital insurance, which is Medicare Part A. And uh, this to the left, these three columns are Social Security and, and disability insurance under Social Security. Last row here, the year the trust funds are depleted. Well, it looks bad enough for Social Security, 2035. For hospital insurance, 2026 is when the Medicare Part A uh, trust fund is supposed to be depleted. It's already on a downward slope. And yet, we want to expand this and make this something that everybody has to sign up for? Uh, this doesn't seem like a very good idea. Uh, Marilyn Singleton uh, writes, and this is from the uh, Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons, she says, uh, currently hospitals make up the shortfall in Medicaid or Medicare reimbursements with payments from private insurance, which would no longer exist under Medicare for All. You could slash CEO salaries, that's a drop in the bucket. Hospital workers are not going to be very happy about taking pay cuts. So where's the money going to come from? And that's a real problem for Medicare for all proposals. I wish I had more time to go through uh, what I mentioned earlier about comparing medical care systems across nations. But as I said, I'll be happy to uh, send the slides to anyone who's interested with all the charts and so forth. And I'll be happy to talk to anyone afterwards if you're, if you're interested. Thank you.